Today the topic of my talk is uh, quantum programming languages and uh, as a special gate set that we talk about is the set of reversible gates, so those are permutations. So I will show, I will present to you um, a, co a new compiler that we recently developed, it's called REVS, and the, in a nutshell the idea is to facilitate compilation of irreversible programs into reversible programs, kind of programs that you can think of as Toffoli networks. And ideally, the idea is that where you start from, the initial program should be pretty high level. Some of you have, have maybe worked uh, on the IAPA QCS program or heard about it. We often talked about the high level, and then there was the higher level where you don't even think about a circuit, and then there was the Heiligman level, even higher than that, where you really don't think about a circuit at all, but you really would like to be able to still go down to a circuit. Right? As a program, it's nice to not have to think about a circuit. So that's the long-term goal here. We want to provide tools so that we have, don't have to worry about the circuits, but we still want to be able to, to produce efficient Toffoli networks and Toff quantum networks, optimize space, and uh, basically beat the Bennett method. The Bennett method is very space intensive. So I hope that at the end of the talk, I can convince you that using this technique, we can reduce the space overhead compared to Bennett. So let me talk first a little bit about quantum um, programming languages, because this ties into an approach that Microsoft has called Liquid. And I want to talk the first 10 minutes or so of my talk about Liquid. So what is Liquid? It's a quantum programming language. It was introduced by uh, Christa Svore and Dave Wecker. And uh, kind of two goals here. One is we want to have something that helps us simulate small-scale algorithms. Of course, that doesn't scale up because a classical computer cannot simulate a quantum computer efficiently. But at least for, for decent sizes, um, we'd like to, to have um, simulation. We'd like to support abstraction as much as possible. We'd like to support visualization of circuits, um, visualization of simulation output. And we'd like to have it so that it's an extensible platform, so that a programmer, um, no matter what, what he or she prefers in terms of a gate set, can extend the platform by, by certain gates. So that's, that's one of the um, goals of Liquid. The other one is compilation. Suppose you have a um, high-level program, you'd like to compile it down to gate level, you'd like to do various optimizations, circuit rewriting techniques. It should ideally all work for different gate sets so that you're not kind of married to a fixed gate set. And, and ultimately, we'd like to compile into real target architectures, really down to the fault tolerance level, and ideally even one day be below the fault tolerance level that we have a complete stack of, of having high-level programs that can drive ultimately the hardware that underlies the computer. That's still for the future, but we, we, we're slowly getting there, taking the steps needed uh, to get there. Um, so, and, and we're going to release that uh, actually this year. The, the target is to release a, a, as a cloud service by the end of this year. So you'll be able to interface with that um, liquid platform. By the way, ask me questions during the talk if you have any, any questions. So what, what does Liquid look like? It is, it is a programming language, first of all. And um, like many other quantum programming languages that have been proposed, it's an embedded language into a host language. That means that whatever you express there is part of a bigger language that already exists. In our case, the language is called f -sharp. It's a functional programming language. If you have background in that area, it's similar to, to OCaml, which in, in, in turn is a little bit similar to ML. So there are all these functional languages. Um, it does not mean that you have to write everything in F-sharp. You can, you can, for instance, have scripts that, that uh, just interpret it, that kind of steer your F-sharp programs. Or you can even interface your stuff with foreign code. You can write code in C-sharp. You can even have external C code or C++ code that you compile into a DLL, and you can interface with that stuff too. So it's, it's, very, it's very open. It has the full power of the .NET framework, which is Microsoft's um, uh, framework. And you can use all that uh, to express programs. But once you express the program, you really have a sequence of gates. So it's a, it's a sort of cir circuit description language. Right? So you use that, that liquid pl platform to express a sequence of gates. So what do you do then once you have gates? Well, you can do many things with them. For instance, you can stick it into a simulator. If you know something about your gate sequence, so if it's a special type of gate sequence, um, then uh, you can do maybe better than a universal simulator, but part of Liquid is a, univer is a universal simulator. It basically does matrix vector product-based simulation of pure states. 
But if you know something special, say it's, if it's a stabilizer um, circuit, then uh, there's, a, there's a kind of a variant of the CHP package. Uh, the Aronson Gottesman package is, is part of this. And uh, if, if you know um, that you start from kind of special Hamiltonians, for instance, in quantum chemistry, uh, Dave Wecker and, and, and collaborators have done a lot of work adding libraries for that, for these kind of simulations. Um, and then the, you, you have different run times. You can simulate it on a desktop, um, the kind of a client scenario. You can, you can run it as a service, kind of with a web interface. And uh, the way it will be dis de dis deployed right now, it will be as a cloud service. So basically, you have a virtual machine with the whole environment. You can change things. Um, you can write your own programs and run them. Um, so that, that those, those are many different runtimes you can have for all these simulators. So, but of course, we're also interested in actually taking, not, not just simulating the, the output sequence, but taking them as a circuit and doing something with the circuits. So you could, for instance, optimize them and then stick them into a simulator. Or you could add quantum error correction. Or uh, you can do all kinds of rewrites. Uh, you can simulate various noise models, um, then export them into formats that ultimately, in the, in, the, in, the long, like the, in the long term goal, would be to have a back end which is a real quantum computer so that you could then run it on a real quantum computer. The real quantum computer will probably have some classical controller and a quantum part, so, but, but, but ideally you would generate a circuit so that you can then steer that, that, uh, the full quantum computer that will actually exist hopefully one day. And as a, as a cute little thing is, you can also render circuits, and that's right now a, kind of a nice feature to have once you have a circuit specified it, you can export it into PDF, SVG, or formats like that, and stick it into your papers if you, if you like. Okay, so there's a paper out um, by, by Dave and Krista that describes the framework. Um, and I, I want to mention that there are, there are many other comp competing programming languages, and, and many of them are really cool. I think the main competitor for us here is Quipper, which is a, it's also a functional programming language embedded into Haskell. And they have done an amazing job doing the QCS program, implementing a lot of quantum algorithms in that language. And I, I will mention later on when it comes to their approach towards um, classical functions, what the differences are. OK, so uh, as a first program, the quantum hello world program is, is sort of teleportation. Um, and to express teleportation, it's useful to first express EPR. So this is, in a nutshell, what a, a very simple a functional program looks like. In, in functional programming, you, will, you come across that keyword let. It really means just definition of something, because everything is an expression in a functional uh, programming language. Everything is a function. So that's the way you define functions. So here, in that case, the function is called EPR. It takes as an input a list of qubits. And then what it does is it will apply an H to the first element of that list. And then it will apply a C0 to the first possible elements of that list. C0 takes two inputs and two outputs, so it will actually apply it to, two, uh, to two, the first two qubits. And that's the corresponding circuit. And teleport would look like this. So you say, OK, I want to have a function teleport. It again takes a list of qubits. And now that the list of qubits better have three elements. Um, you first pick up the tail. That's a, a list manipulation. Right? You have a list. You can pick the tail, which are the kind of everything except for the first element. And then you, you run EPR, that function we just defined, on the tail. Then you would do a C0 to the first qubit and Hadamard. Uh, you would do a measurement on, on, the, uh, on the middle qubit, which is the first qubit of the tail. And then you do a classical controlled X correction depending on that result. And uh, then you measure the other qubit, which is the, the first one of the original list, and you do a, a classical control Z correction condition on that bit. So overall, that's the circuit, and that's automatically generated from that program. As you see, it's exactly this, the circuit that you wanted. And you can, you can run that now. You can say you can loop n times, run the same circuit, create first an, a random initial state, and see if it correctly teleports through that circuit. And if you do that, that's kind of the dump how it would look like. It's, there are various ways you can graphically visualize this, but like, I like to just look at the dump of the, of the data. And then you see, OK, that those were the, the random initial states, every other line. And after teleport, you actually get those states exactly back. So it uh, works fine on that small case example. Um, more complex things, say if you want to entangle several qubits, create a cat state. 
the syntax for that would look like this. So you do a Hadamard first on one qubit, um, and then you pick up that, that, uh, that first qubit. And uh, you can then run a for loop over all the elements in the tail and do a C naught from that, that head to the elements of the tail. So what's really interesting here is if you're like a purist, a functional programming purist, if you come from Haskell, for instance, that's not something you would really like because it mixes the paradigms. It's uh, functional and imperative. A for loop is an imperative thing. In, in Haskell, you'd probably express that recursively. But F sharp is very pragmatic. It doesn't care. It takes functional elements. It takes imperative elements. You can mix and match them. So in practice, it's kind of nice to sometimes have freedom like that. Um, I've tried to do many things functional only, but sometimes it's nice to throw in a for loop every once in a while. And here that, that operator is also interesting, that's called a bow tie. It means you have a list and you apply the same operator to all the elements of the list. Right? So in that case you measure all of them. So the circuit would look like this, you create the Hadamard, right? that's this gate. Then uh, you, you run through that for loop, which is all these C naughts. And then the bow tie just does a measurement of all. There are various ways you can optimize now, there's, there's a so-called fold operation that will try to, to minimize the, um, the depth and try to arrange circuits and compress them in depth. And there are various other ways. Um, like, there's a little bit of peepholing, but not as much as I would like, actually. Um, there, there's more work to be done on that end. And then if you run that circuit, for instance, you get, as expected, only two possible outcomes, uh, the all zero or the all one. You can define your own gates. So C0 is, of course, part of the library, but if you would decide to define it yourself, you could declare your own gates, basically by matrix elements. You can define them as sparse matrices. Once you define them, they can be used inside your circuits um, at will. Uh, this is a component of Shaw's algorithm. Shaw's algorithm was one of the first things uh, that Dave Wecker did. Uh, this is just a piece of it. This is an, an adder, more specifically a modular adder, where he used the, uh, the Beauregard method to implement the, the modular adder. So it uses kind of the Draper idea to do it via phase, in, uh, phase space implementation, by complex phases. Uh, this, is, this is the code, it's a very short program, and uh, this is the circuit that corresponds to it. Also, that's automatically generated. Shaw's algorithm, Dave did uh, up to, I think, 14, uh, 14 bits. You might ask, what's the point? The point is to show what we can, in principle, do, right? So how far does this scale? Um, Roughly speaking, using um, a, a large cluster and long time and various optimizations, you can do up to 30 qubits. As you can simulate stuff up to 30 qubits. But the, um, the usual things that you might want to do first, they, they go up to 20 qubits. And I think the version that will be released for academic use for free will have uh, capabilities up to 20 or 22 qubits. If you want to have more of this hardcore stuff, um, uh, I think the, the, uh, the academics still can get it for free, but it uses a lot of computational resources on the back end, right? So the, the Azure time that's needed for that, uh, I think Microsoft sponsors it, but uh, um, it, 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 it's, it, it's uh, say, say less, less, less easy to get access to. But the academic part, I think, is completely free. If you have students who want to use it for small scale, it will be very easy to get licenses for that. Basically, it just means you go to go on GitHub and get access to the VM, and then you can run it. That's that's all you need to do. Okay. So let's. Uh, okay. Final thing I wanted to mention about Liquid is it's easy to uh, wrap a, a logical level circuit with error correction in Liquid. So here, for instance, you have um, the teleport circuit, and suppose you want to do it with encoded gates on top of the Steen code. Uh, no human ever wants to write that down, or at least not very often. But the compiler can do that for you automatically now. And you can simulate various noise models now on top of a, of a circuit like this. There's a talk that Dave gave at the workshop in, at Waterloo this summer. I think it's a, good, it's a good video. OK, let's shift gears now, and let's talk about the synthesis questions that arise. OK, so first of all, what's the gate set? Well, that's a moving target. We don't know what's the best fault-tolerant gate set to work with. A, a very popular one is Clifford and T. But uh, various other ones have been proposed. Um, for instance, the V gate, which is nicer in some sense because it directly relates to quaternions in a nice way, or to a spe specific order in the quaternions. Unfortunately, there's no uh, code known, at least to my knowledge, that would directly give it to us. We can get it via probabilistic constructions. But, 
And there are various other gate sets for which there is synthesis, where, for which there are synthesis methods. And there, there might be a longer list here. It depends on what we, we can get. But the point is that we want to be able to synthesize into all these gate sets. So high level, we'd like to start with an algorithm, produce the, the sequence. And how the way this works is we first decompose it into some, well, like a first decomposition might say, we have single qubit rotations here. We might have some permutations here that the reversible, uh, the reversible compiler can then handle. Right? This is, might be an, a part of the program, like an oracle that's irreversibly specified, but the compiler better translate it into a permutation. Right? And other parts here um, we have to take care of by single qubit synthesis. Right? Those are typically word problems over um, an expanding generating set of these local uh, uh, unitaries. And then, uh, of course, once you have that, then you have to have a method to implement a T-gate, for instance, by, by distillation. What's really cool is that nowadays there are methods that scale linearly. So on the single qubit side, there are methods now that scale linearly in uh, the logarithm of uh, 1 over epsilon. Right? So the way Kitaev gives you a higher order polynomial. But these methods, they're probabilistic. They work extremely well in practice, and they're linear. And they're, so that means they're super fast. Um, and that, that basically uses uh, number theory. So I'm not going to go into that part. I just wanted to mention it because it's, it's, it's a very cool development that uh, using number theory, it's possible to, get, to address rotations very efficiently, and you get very short factorizations. So for, 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 it depends on the gate set, but for, say, Clifford and T and a bunch of other gate sets, that seems to be the preferred method these days. And there's, there's a lot of developments recently that try to flesh out that approach. Um, basically, you start with your unitary, then you round it into a nice domain. And then over that domain, you have an, a method based on number theory to synthesize. OK, I don't, don't want to talk about that so much. I want to talk about the, the, the re reversible computing part. And the first question is, like, hey, why, why do we care at all? Why, why should we care about reversible compu computing? So I want to motivate it a little bit. Uh, so one reason is arithmetic. Everybody knows in Shor's algorithm, there's a lot of modular arithmetic, um, how to implement that. That's a case of reversible computing. But then again, it's not really challenging because you, all you need to do is sort of constant modular arithmetic. Right? You, we have always the case where one input is a constant. You multiply by a constant number. You know at compile time what that number is. Then you build up your modular exponentiation and so on. It's more, slightly more challenging, say, for elliptic curve delogs, because then in the middle of your uh, arithmetic implementation, you have the case where you have to kind of add two unknown numbers, you have to multiply, you have to take an inverse of an unknown number. That's much more challenging than the arithmetic you need for, uh, for um, factoring. But it can also be done. For HHL, you need to compute integer in inverses. That's really challenging. Uh, various approaches have been appro uh, uh, proposed for that. One is, for instance, based on Newton, a newton raphson kind of iteration algorithms. Um, if you really roll it out, it leads to non-trivial uh, problems. But a bunch of nice papers have been written about that recently. So there, but that's only one area where reversible computing crops up. Another is, for instance, in amplitude amplification in, in Grover's algorithm, your oracles, they will typically require implementation of a classical function. Right? Think, for instance, you won't really want to find the satisfying assignments of a three-set formula. You would have to implement that three-set formula somehow, and then uh, you would actually run Grover's algorithm on top of that. Or if you want to do collision finding and, and, and other algorithms, uh, amplitude amplification based, you have somewhere in your algorithm a part where you have a classical computation that you need to do reversibly. Another example is uh, quantum walks. So quantum walks, like if you do them on a data structure, you typically have to update a data structure in some way to implement a walk operation. And that might, might use um, reversible computing uh, as a subroutine to really figure out what the operations are at the gate level. It may or may not. Maybe your walk does not require that, but it, it, may, it may be. For instance, in the IAPA project, uh, the IAPA challenge, one of the challenges was to do a game tree evaluation for a very specific game called Hex. And um, so part of that challenge was to actually implement the moves on that game. Right? And that, that, was, that was done by specifying them irreversibly, and it had to be done then reversibly. Another area where reversible computing might be uh, of use is um, quantum simulation. 
We heard uh, from Robin on the first day that, that uh, about the methods for efficient simulation. Somewhere deep down in the, in the fine print, there is the need for addressing and indexing somehow uh, the elements of a Hamiltonian for like a sparse matrix. Um, the implementation of those functions, arguably, they, they could benefit from techniques like that. It will, of course, depend on your specific use case. But, but uh, there might be use cases for reversible computation there. Also, um, in quantum chemistry, as far as I know, there are all these sophisticated techniques that work directly with the terms, PQRS and so on. But um, conceivably, we could compute those things also on the fly. Um, who knows? Maybe we come across some Hamiltonians where it's really interesting to compute the, the terms on the fly by some reversible method. Um, I just tried to scrape together what I could in terms of motivation here. I hope I kept you motivated. Um, so, all right. So, okay, I want to mention also there is a previous um, compiler. It's an existing compiler called Quipper. And it has a way to, to start from a classical irreversible program and allows to do something called lifting. And it will lift the program to a higher level. What it does, at least to the best of my knowledge, is to implement the Bennett method, the original 73 Bennett method, which is a very nice method to implement from the implementation standpoint. And, uh, and then uh, you, um, you get a Toffoli network that way. So I want to kind of talk about that now in the next part of the talk how these techniques work, li work like, how they relate to something called pebble games that allow to keep the space overhead smaller, how, uh, why it is difficult to implement pebble games, um, or what is in, in, entailed in that, and our approach towards, our heuristics towards tackling these, these uh, space-time trade-offs. Any questions here? Okay. All right, so let's, let's, let me give you an example of a classical irreversible program that you might want to make, make reversible, all right? So, uh, oh, somebody got the joke already. That was fast. So uh, suppose your program has some control flow. It's an if-then-else expression, right? So you get your function. You get two inputs. They could be floats. And depending on what the inputs are, maybe you want to define a Boolean variable, right? And then depending on what the Boolean variable is, you want to define some other variables. And ultimately, you want to stick it into a, a function that, that uh, does maybe different things for different inputs, all right? So like how, this, is, this is typically irre irreversible, right? Because um, we'll just execute one branch on a given input. But how about if we, if we were to, to execute that program on a superposition of inputs? How would we make it reversible? So, um, so for this, this, the function here is the predicate. Then we go into the branches. We have two branches in that case. And then ultimately, we would run, we run the function. So uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so how would you make that reversible? So there are kind of, I know, a couple of ways, and many of them have been described in literature previously. So one very straightforward way is to just say we compute that predicate reversibly, that kind of recursion here. So we kind of push that to another part of the synthesizer that says, please do that step, right? The computation of that predicate <coughs> do that reversibly, but suppose we have that already, then let, let this be the result of the, of the predicate. If it's, if it's one, say, then we would execute branch A. If it's zero, we'd execute branch B. And then we have to clean up everything in terms of garbage that we produced here to return that clean. Right? That's very important, of course, because otherwise we cannot have quantum coherent algorithms if we don't clean up stuff at the very end. Okay, but this circuit, obviously, uh, for any given Y on that branch here, uh, will apply either A or B depending on what that bit in the predicate was. Right? It's completely clean because these things are, are cleaned up. It has one downside. Um, it's structurally very nice, but it has the downside that you add control here. So the naive way would be to expand that over your gate set and then add control to each gate. And that, that can be quite challenging because it leads to large overheads. There are other methods. So this is a method I learned from Dmitry Maslov. And he described it in a, in a paper. I think that was the first paper that described that method. You can actually do it without adding control to do two branches, but you get a slight space overhead. So you can execute A and B completely independently, completely unconditional. But then you, you sort of route the branch you want. You route them using these control swaps. Right? And these are, those are basically Fredkin gates. Right? Those are wires of several qubits, but with, the, with, these, with a cascade of Fredkin gates, you can route depending on whether that's on or off. You will, if it's on, you will route this guy down here. It picks up A, and then it goes back and it's here. 
if it's zero, it directly goes into B, right? And it picks up the right, the right thing. The, the, the catch is, sort of the catch of this circuit is, apart from having more space overhead, that you need to stick in a state here which is an eigenstate of both these operators, otherwise it doesn't work. If those are permutations, the all one state is always an, an eigenstate, right? That, that, that thing here is the all one state. Um, but you will leave the quantum domain if you, uh, you, leave, you leave the classical domain if you do that, right? Everything here might be just Toffelis, but you stick in something that's the all one that makes that whole thing hard to simulate. And then I'm kind of worried also about the correctness of everything because you might produce large Toffoli networks and then you don't know what they actually do. We want to be able to simulate them so it's not just garbage in, garbage out. And so if, if your circuit uses elements like this, it might be a little bit harder to simulate because we have no efficient simulator. Whereas if it's completely Toffoli and it's a classical input, then we can simulate things efficiently classically. And so, But that's of course in the back of my, our minds and a compiler hopefully can make the choice between that and that method, right? Depending on what, what fits better in the, in, the, in the compilation at that stage. Uh, there's yet another method, and that's actually what we use right now in revs. Uh, it's a little bit dirty, but um, so what we do, so, so as I mentioned, it's nicer if you have everything Toffoli and classical input. So we, we avoid to have the all one state here, but the expense to pay is that we need to kind of make a copy and then run the branches, clean them up separately, and even then, it's, it still has that Y information around, so you kind of have to clean that up also later. But that's, that's actually what we use right now in, in, in inside revs to make an if-then-else statement. So that's kind of higher level control flow, if-then-else. There's, there's ways to do loops if the loops are bounded, but I don't want to go into that. I want to talk next about actually drilling down these boxes. So what's inside the boxes, the elementary things? Well, at the gate level, we will have a classical irreversible gate description. Right? It will be a network, say, over AND and NOT gates. They're composed to make large circuits over these guys. The question is how to make that reversible. So the, the, the very straightforward thing is to replace each AND gate by a Toffoli gate. And you get something like this. Uh, and you will then, of course, have to initialize all these outputs, right? all these, these bits which carry the output. You have to initialize them with some clean zeros. At least that's the naive idea. And then your, your circuit will look like the original circuit, but uh, it will only use reversible components. And by the way, there was a nice paper recently that studied the alternatives to Toffoli from a like, high-level standpoint. What, what are the possible reversible gate sets? Uh, and they gave a complete classification of all the, the reversible models. I'm going to stick to Toffoli, though, in this talk. So Toffoli, C0, and not. that's the universal gate set. So if you do the naive thing and say you have a linear dependence of your of your gates, then what you will get is something that looks like a gigantic V. Right? You, you will do a gate, and then as the output here, and you have another input, then you do the next gate, and then you do the next one, till you reach the very, end, the, the, the very end of your long cascade, copy out the result, and then, of course, all these things are now dirty. Right? They, they are not zero anymore. So how do we bring them back to zero? Well, Bennett's idea was, now we undo that entire computation. Nice, we get all these zeros back. Beautiful. Right? So that will definitely work. That will produce the result in a reversible way, but you, you picked up all these extra qubits. Right? And most of the time, inside this V here, there's this gigantic space which is idle. You don't do anything with the qubits. Right? You, did a, you did something in the past at some point, and then you keep them around for a very long time and don't even touch them anymore. That's very, very wasteful, and, and uh, hopefully for a lot of programs, we don't have to do that. So hopefully we can do sort of a garbage collection that frees them up early and let, let's, let's us use them in somewhere else in the program and then later when we, need it, when we need them to clean things up, then we might have to recompute them. So that's the basic idea behind the, uh, the, the Pebble game and I want to motivate that really quickly by just giving you an example of what the Pebble game is. So Bennett realized, okay, this, this whole V structure is really bad in terms of space, right? Because space scales with time scales with the number of gates you had in, in, the, in the irreversible thing. And that's, that's sort of bad. Um, so he introduced this game called Pebble Game. And it works like this. You have n boxes, and the boxes correspond to stages in your computation. It's not necessarily just a bit. It can be a whole register, like a, everything you need as a checkpoint to move a computation forward. Right? So your whole computation might be decomposed in a bunch of segments, kind of checkpoints. You go from one segment to the next. 
you could take a snapshot here, right, and then clean up everything else here and then move to the next checkpoint. Those are the boxes he was thinking about. But for, for the time being, you can even think about them as being bits, if you have just a bunch of bits that depend in a linear fashion. Um, yeah, this, this one-dimensional nature arises uh, because of the stages, and you assume that like, you can always put a pebble on the first box, that means you can always have sort of the input, and then if you want to have the next, if you want to put a pebble on the next box, it means you must have uh, a pebble on the original box. You must have that information around to do the next step of the computation. Okay, so it's always allowed to put a pebble on the first box, but wherever you want to put the next pebble, you better have a pebble to the left. Okay, so you can do this, it's allowed. But you cannot jump right now to four, which would be the end of the computation. You must first have something at three, but it's no problem if you have a lot of pebbles available. You just put a pebble here, and then you're at four, right? So that's easy. Now you, you, you have done, you can copy out the result, but now you want to clean up all these pebbles. That means you have computed something, there's garbage, you want to remove the garbage. How do you do it? Well, now you can compute this pebble number three, which you can do because you still have the information in two around. Nice, now we can undo two, right, because we have one around, and we can always remove one. So in seven steps we produced, we kind of shifted that pebble from the very left to the very right. But we spent four pebbles for that, that means we have kind of four quantum registers to do the job. The question is can we do it with less? It turns out yes, one can do the same thing with three only, and uh, this is how it works. So in the beginning, you have no choice. You have to put it in one. Right? There's, no, there's no options. Uh, then, um, again, you have no options. The next step, you could remove it again, but that would be pointless. So the, the next step would be to, to move it to the next box. Uh, then again, you have basically no choice, right? You could remove this guy, but that actually doesn't do anything. So you will mo remove it here. Now, you don't have a fourth pebble available. We, we assume we have only three. So we need, we need to clean up one of these guys. It turns out it's, it's best to clean up the first one. Okay, now we have a, a third pebble. We can move it here. Uh, now we want to clean up these guys. We do it by removing this, putting it back here, cleaning this, and here. You see it got a little bit longer, but we, we still got to the very end. Okay, that's the spirit of all these space-time trade-offs um, that Bennett investigated. And there is a, a very nice paper. It's, to my knowledge, it's very little known. I've, only a few people know that paper. But many nil long time ago looked at the question, like if you fix the length of your sequence and you fix the number of pebbles, how long does it actually take for you to reach the end of, 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 of the sequence, right? And kind of you, you can do it now a table. And we, like the, the, the strategy I showed you on the previous slide, sorry if it's a little bit small, but it, here it means like if you have four segments in total, and if you have three pebbles available, it will take you nine steps to compute, complete that computation. And similarly, you can say, okay, if I have six pebbles available, for instance, how far can I actually go? If I don't care about the length of going back and forth, back and forth, how far can I ultimately go? You can't go, like, ultimate, like let, the six is not good, let's take five. You can go up to 16, right? You cannot do 17, but you can do 16 steps, and it will take you 71 rounds of going back and forth. And so for each uh, kind of number of pebble here and each length of that sequence, you can figure out what's the optimal move here. And uh, what is more, Knill showed that this function here, which, which is the function plotted here, uh, has a recursive expansion in term, terms of smaller values of f, like for s, fn minus 1, fn s minus 1, and I think fn minus 1, s minus 1, a certain combination. So you can use dynamic programming to compute all these numbers, then you move to the next one, you use the previous results, you hold, you hold them in memory, and that's extremely fast. So the, the, uh, the Alex, the, the intern, implemented that and uh, was able to find all these strategies. It's very, very fast. So for, for one-dimensional chains, solving the Pebble game is, is, really, is really easy. And this is a visualization what the Bennett method looks like then, once you solve the Pebble game. It means here, this is time. A black dot means you computed that qubit and it's around in memory. Right? This, is, this is Bennett's strategy. It just computes them all, keeps them in memory, and then has the final output. This is what, what, you, see, what you saw in, 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 in papers that actually synthesized the circuit and then plotting them as a big PDF. This is a strategy that cleans up some parts earlier. So it kind of, it, it uses um, uh, space, irreversible space times the square root of t 
which is a little bit better than that. So it's, there's a little bit of white space generated here. You can go a little bit further out. And this is pushing it to, to the extreme. Kind of you, you, you compute something and you immediately uncompute it and you try to go as far as you can out in the, in the strategy. That, that, that's called the, um, uh, that looks like a fractal really, and it's called the um, uh, lange mckenzie tap strategy. It's, it's a very well-known result in complexity theory that, that there's this uh, strategy. So you can solve the dynamic programming task and you can plot for each uh, width what's the possible depth we can achieve. So the, the lowest guy here will be the Bennett strategy. Uh, it scales linear. Um, if, if you just slightly reduce the number of pebbles, right, then it's very resource intensive. Bennett needs a, a huge number of, of pebbles. But if you go, say, to 50 pebbles, you still have almost linear growth. It's, of course, at some point, it will, it will escape exponentially here. But in, say, a reasonable range, it will still go linear. And then you got that exponential strategy corresponding to a fractal where you get um, an exponential overhead in terms of circuit depth. But you can, do, uh, you can go uh, very far. OK, so Bennett investigated that uh, in, his 98, uh, in his 89 paper and showed if you push it to the extreme, you can have strategies that take, uh, you, you can do in, in, in uh, reversible time, which is almost the same as the um, irreversible time, and over slide space overhead, you can actually do computations. But unfortunately, that epsilon here is really tricky to handle. Um, as you take the limit, epsilon goes to zero, that actually that constant blows out. So it's not so easy to use that result. And um, the other space-time trade-offs, if you, if you take, for instance, um, uh, there, there's, a, there's a paper that discusses like a whole class of schemes so that the Bennett strategy is one limiting case and the, the Lange McKenzie tab is another. Uh, I want to also mention like that's all for one dimensional chains. You can do the same for um, general directed acyclic graphs and then the problem gets really, really hard. Right? I mentioned that in principle we can use dynamic programming for the 1D chain. Once we have arbitrary graphs, it's, it's basically hopeless to find the optimal pebbling strategy. It's a piece-based complete problem. So we need, we need to have some heuristics um, to, to tackle that. And I want to show in the next few slides, I want to show you a heuristic. Because what we do is we take the classical program, make a dependency graph analysis that will not be a one-dimensional chain. It will be like a DAG. And now we want to know what's a good way to pebble this, this thing. Okay, so we have a particular heuristic how to do that. How much time do I have left? Seven minutes only? Okay. So I want, to, I want to at least give you a flavor of that. And we call it mutually data flow analysis. So essentially what we try to find as part of the structure of the program is things where you can do in-place operations. So in-place operations are operations that override stuff. A good example is, is, an, is an adder. For instance, this is, this is a, a very nice adder circuit that allows you to do an in-place operation x, y goes to x, x plus y. Okay, so that way you can override part of your data and reuse it, and you will not generate garbage if you use that. Generally, at a program level, you can identify things. In F sharp, for instance, there's a keyword mutable. And then that's like those things potentially we can have these benefits of, of updating them in place. It's a step backward in a sense from, from Quipper, because Quipper has this nice vision of like ultimately implementing a, a linear type system. I, I don't, I'm not sure if they already have a linear type system implemented, but I think that's the vision. Here it's sort of going the opposite way because we, we want to use mutation and uh, override. From a programming standpoint, it's not good to use mutation. <laughs> if you want to build large scale software, it's very bad if programmers use mutation because they, mutation typically leads to errors that are very hard to find. So it's nice if everything is immutable except for a few things. But we uh, have the standpoint it's nice for the performance reason, for space reasons, to use some of the mutable structure you might have in your program. And uh, you might actually create mutable, uh, you might create in-place operations. If you, for instance, have a function where you know F inverse also has a nice circuit, you can make in-place uh, functions. Okay, so in, in, uh, basically what, what this whole uh, data dependency analysis is about is you can take your initial program, then parse it, turn it into an abstract syntax tree, then you walk the syntax tree to find out dependencies between the code, and then you turn it into a graph. In the graph now, we track two kinds of information. We track dependencies between variables. Those are the dashed arrows. And we track which variables are mutable and get updated by stuff. Right? In that case, for instance, if it's the AND function, 
we know uh, there will be two inputs and the AND function will depend on it. We will need something to store the result and that will thing gets mutated and get the output. The corresponding circuit, of course, in that case would be just this. But the examples can be more complicated. Here, for instance, there's a function that uses two subfunctions. There's a function f of two arguments is the OR and G is the AND, and then you XOR them together. And I made a typo here, that should be the OR gate here. So you take AB, you compute the AND in that branch, take AB and compute the OR in that branch, and then finally you XOR them together, get the output. Right, so that would be the dependency graph in that case. So the question is now, how do we turn that dependency graph into a reversible circuit? We have an algorithm that does it. It basically computes the uh, inverse topological order of these gates, and then tries to clean them up one by one. If it's an output, it doesn't need to be cleaned up. This guy, for instance, is, is not an output, so it needs to be cleaned up. This guy needs to be cleaned up. So we, we walk all the gates and uh, clean them up one by one. It just, re it, it just amounts to rewriting that graph structure and producing another graph where you now you have all these paths. Right? Each path now corresponds to a qubit, or all these bold graphs, bold edges, bold edges correspond to qubits. So we would need um, uh, several of these to implement it. And that's the, uh, the, the, the circuit that results in it. And what you can see, if you look very closely, you will have some points where you have an ancilla, then you use it for something, and then you clean it up here early. Right? And then at that point, you can now use that qubit somewhere else in the circuit, for instance, down here as a new ancilla, or this qubit here, uh, here you can now, it's now free and you can use it somewhere else. It's not that dramatic in that example, but it turns out in larger scale examples that reuse can be quite powerful. Two minutes? Okay. okay. Right, so I'm gonna skip this example. This is a description of the algorithm. It's, in the, it's described in the paper. It, it essentially, it just walks the, um, the uh, dependency graph in inverse topological order. And there are cases where we cannot do it eagerly. Also, that's described in the paper. So sometimes you can have the case where you have an input. It, uh, it will be used as part of the intermediate computation, but then this guy gets mutated, right? And then this might, again, depend on something else, and you can produce the output. So if you would try to clean this guy up now, it's not possible anymore, because that input here has changed. From B, it's now out, and you don't have the original B anymore. You can't clean up this thing. So in that case, there's always the fallback that you can fall back to the, the Bennett method and compute this, copy out that bit, and undo everything else. Right? So our compiler detects that. It tries to be aggressive, clean up as much as possible that can be cleaned up. And if it runs into something that cannot be cleaned up, it just applied the, the, the Bennett method to, to do brute forcing it, to brute forcing the, the cleanup stage. Okay, I want to show a few experiments. So, uh, for instance, here's an implementation of a carry ripple adder, completely classical, completely irreversible. This is like somebody who would actually want to implement a carry ripple adder would do it if you do it in software, right? And so then Revs compiled it into a Toffoli network. And here the, here's the comparison of the cost. So if you do it hand optimized, that's kind of the Kukaro et al. I showed you on the, uh, previously, right, the quantum circuit. This is how it would scale. This is the number of Toffoli gates. And by the way, we only count, count Toffoli. We ignore C naught and not gates. This is how many qubits you would need. And if you would do the Bennett, the direct Bennett strategy of compute, copy out, uncompute, the number of gates would be actually be the same in that case, the Toffoli gates, but the number of qubits would be quite a bit higher compared to here. Here we show the compilation time, but it's, that's really in, insignificant in, in that case. But as you can see here in the eager cleanup, we get the eager cleanup is our method in REVs. Get the same number of, of gates, but the number of qubits is always a little bit lower than in the direct um, Bennett method. So we save qubits if we do it that way. It gets more pronounced if you look at more complex functions. For instance, we implemented a carry select adder, which optimizes the depth of an adder. It goes from n, basically, to the square root of n. We implemented that irreversibly, stuck it into revs, and look at, looked at what the result is. Typically, what you get is that the gate count is a little bit higher than Bennett. That's because we, we need to do it clean up early, right? We spend some effort cleaning up things up early. Uh, but the number of qubit savings is, is nice. So we get this nice uh, time-space trade-off in, in the curve. And I want to mention last a really large-scale example of SHA-2, actually 256-bit uh, block size. Um, you can implement that also. This is just taken from Wikipedia. We implemented that irreversibly in, in F sharp, it's very easy. And what it does is, it's, it's a block size, uh, it's, it, 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 it's, it's a hash function that has several rounds. In each round, you, 
uh, you update um, several registers. Each one is 30 bits wide. Um, there are certain functions. I'm not going to go into how they are defined, but like they are Boolean functions. And then you, like each round, then you update your register, and then you stick it into the next round. There are a few constants that are used in, inside that cipher, and your, your initial message that you want to hash comes in sort of chunks and gets part of all this, this mess. It's very easy to code that in F-sharp, stuck it into, I thought, okay, first we actually came up with a hand implementation where we looked at the structure of that cipher and discovered, oh, there's a lot of XORs, controlled XORs, and cyclic permutations, we can leverage all that stuff to come up with a very nice quantum circuit. But that's a human who looked at it for, for a day or so and came up with, a, with an optimized version. Then we stuck it into the tool, and, the, and now you see the power of this, this early cleanup. If you, if you look at the, 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 the hand-optimized one, um, the number of qubits can be shown to be independent of the number of rounds. And that makes sense because you have that state that goes from one round of the cipher to the next round, right? And that doesn't need to, that doesn't need to increase. It just gets updated by that external knowledge about the, the, the blocks, right? So it does not increase with a round number. The Toffoli count, of course, increases with a round number because you do more Toffoli gates. If you do Bennett, you get an increase with the number of rounds because you pick up garbage in each round and that will increase linearly with the number of rounds. But our tool actually finds the same number of qubits here. It does it completely automatically. You have to input and, and, you, and you run it. The Toffoli count here is uh, slightly higher than that count, but it even beats the Bennett method out here. Okay, and we, we actually um, also ran through a bunch of benchmarks from the classical circuits and systems community, those are like FPGA people. They came up with a lot of benchmark circuits. Some of them can be quite large. One is actually called too large. Um, and we're able to uh, compile all of them um, and comparing, compare them to the, to the Bennett method. And we get qubit reduction, number of qubit reductions that are roughly 50% or so. Sometimes they can be more. Sometimes they, we get no, no improvement. Sometimes it can be very significant. Okay, and to test it all, we have a very simple simulator because Toffoli networks we can simulate efficiently by just running through the, the state vector. And that's basically all, that's the entire code of the Toffoli gate simulator. I just wanted to show you um, for, for what that part does. All right, um, there's some issues. Um, if you want to clean up stuff early and use it in conjunction with recursion, it doesn't seem to mix and match well. So um, some of you might be familiar with the Karatsuba algorithm for integer multiplication. If you do that eagerly, uh, it's not good. It gives you something that's worse than the naive school method. Uh, if you do it lazily, you keep the bits around, you get the, the Karatsuba speed up, and I still have to wrap my head around why that is. Um, all right, thank you very much. I want to mention that we are hiring postdocs. If you're interested, let us know. Uh, are there any questions for Martin? Thanks, it's a great talk. So for over the years, there, there have been a separate Microsoft-funded effort uh, to develop uh, quantum computers based on the topological quantum field theory paradigm. Has there been any conversation between the true groups about taking liquid and making it output, not circuit models, but operations of, you know, braiding operations on anions as the, the output of your program? Right, great question. The question is, what's the relationship between this effort, which is a compiler effort, and the topological quantum computing effort? Basically, yeah. The, the, in a nutshell, what happens is that the topological models can give you universal gate sets that are very germane to your particular model, if it's metaplectic anions or Fibonacci anions. They will all r give rise to different universal gate sets that are protected by just being topological. Um, those gate sets, we can then ask the question, can we compile into them? That's, that's one of the things we work on. So recently we have a paper, it should be on the archive very soon, where we take some of these gate sets and um, then show how to take a, a target unitary and approximate it by those gates. And the gate sets are very different depending on whether you have metaplectic anions or Ising anions, SU2 level 4. You get very different gate sets. For some reason they all have in common that they, their entries are algebraic numbers. So they live in a number field extension over the rationals. I don't fully understand why that is, but that seems to happen a lot. And there are powerful theorems that tell you whenever you have that and you're universal, then you can be very efficiently universal. So our goal is at, in Redmond to take whatever the, the guys in Station Q can give us, 
and compile it, com compile higher level algorithms into it. So that's one link between our groups. There are other links like having to do with error correction, other links on the simulation end, there's collaborations between the, the chemistry people back and forth. But I, I'm mainly involved in that uh, qubit synthesis along with Vadim Klutchnikov, uh, Alex Botcherov, you have John Yard and Krista. We're having, every once in a while we talk to the guys, Station Q, about these gate sets. Any other questions? Okay. Well, let's uh, thank Martin again.